Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Parents, you ever want to have to talk with your teenagers? Because teenagers can be a little bit of work. You ever want to have to talk with them? You ever want to break up with them? <laughs> you ever want to sit them down and be like, listen, I think we should just be friends. <laughs> it's not working out. It's just not working. <laughs> we are fooling ourselves. No, 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 no. It's not like, no, no, no. We're not seeing any other kids. We're not ready. <laughs> but if you want to see some other parents, that's just fine. <laughs> we just, if you could just give us our stuff back, that'd be cool. We call it <laughs> That's good advice, huh? <laughs> For the younger generation, which we're talking about today. Well, you know, it turns out the Chinese are winning. That within 10 years, they're going to be a global dominant power. And they're going to control the, 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 the world order, not only economically, but militarily. And they're going to do it with American assistance, much like America took over and became the, world, the dominant world order back in 1945. That is the assessment according to Michael Pillsbury, director of Center on Chinese Strategy. He's advised six different U.S. presidents on Asian affairs. He recently wrote a book called The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower. He says they made a decision about 40 years ago to go for the long run. They're going to ignore a lot of the, the short-term wins in order to gain big wins in economics, in tech, science, in commerce, in education. And they're going to do that if they can through the front door, through permission, or if necessary, through the back door by stealing it. And so their plan is to, like I said, it's just a decade away now that they're going to... Uh, dominate the world. And they're thinking generationally. That's how they started years ago. Now there's something very powerful about thinking generationally. The Chinese didn't come up with that. We can see that going back for centuries, for millennia. We see it in the Bible that God talks about the value of thinking generationally. So that's what we're going to be talking about today as we wrap up our series we've been in where we're talking about the great commission that we're calling Accept the Challenge. And so we're glad that uh, if you're joining us online, I'm glad you're part of that uh, with, with all of you. We want to talk about what it means to pass it on. I mean, to think generationally when it comes to the great commission, not just ourselves. And what does that look like? Why is that important? You know, any good family, good parents think generationally. I mean, they're thinking their kids, not just themselves, they're thinking their kids, they're thinking their grandkids. You might have seen that bumper sticker that some people put on. They say, I'm spending my, ki my kids' inheritance, <laughs> right? Now, that, that's funny for parents, but not too many kids think that's funny. That's not funny, you know. <laughs> but in contrast, we actually see a different approach talked about in the Bible. Notice at the top of your outline, Proverbs 13 says, there in verse 22, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. Good parents don't think selfishly. Now, it's not just an inheritance financially. It's an inheritance that you pass on the legacy. You pass on of values, of wisdom. There's a lot of things that we can pass on in an inheritance. But we're thinking not just of our kids, but even our grandkids. You see generational thinking all over the Bible. For example, in Exodus 3.15, it says, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. There it is, generational thing. He says the faith is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are all related. They're families. It's generational. We see it time and time again. For example, Timothy is a mentoree of Paul. Paul picks it as a young kid. He says, hey, I'm going to mentor you. He really becomes like a son to him. 
And he's talking to him at one place about his faith and how he came, uh, how he came to Christ. And he says it's generational. He points to his mom and his grandmother. He says, I am reminded of your faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm persuaded also lives in you. So he's talking to him. He's saying, hey, can, you, you're, you look at your faith. It comes generationally to you through, you know, Mama Eunice and Grandma Lois. That's where it comes down. Paul talks to Timothy. He says, you then, my son. He's not a son, but he says he's like, he's like his son. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Here's generational thinking. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So here you actually have this idea of thinking four levels. He said, there's Paul. Paul passed it on to Timothy. Timothy passed it on to reliable people. Reliable people passed it on to others. Thinking out multiple generations. I want us as a church to be thinking three or four, but thinking three. Three, in other words, three, you know, your kids and your grandkids are not just if they're related to you, but thinking three generationally. Maybe, you know, like Paul and Timothy, they weren't related, but he had a mentoring relationship going on. And so each of us should have like a Paul in our life, have a Timothy in our life. Somebody who's influencing us, somebody we're influencing, somebody we're mentoring. This is what it means to be thinking generationally. And it means, obviously, it means some of your time, some of your effort, it's a, it's some of your emotional outlay, but it's an investment. It's an investment so that our church is a generational church, a church that thinks um, thinks three, thinks you know, we're thinking outside of us. I want our church to be a church where our kids and our grandkids love to attend. You know, not just, oh, that's mom's church. That's dad's church. No, no, our kids, it's their church. And our grandkids, it's their church. Now, over the years, we've had, like over the last decade particularly, we've had a number of young people get involved in our church. Many of them have come to Christ in our church. And then the, and they're kids, and they grow up. All of a sudden, they're around. Here they are. They're, they're involved. And then we've also had a number of people that have come, and they've just said, I like this church. I want to be part of it. And they're, they're, they're involved. Now, the, we have people, older people, that, that see young people involved in our church, and they go, hey, that's cool. That's great. I love to be part of a church that's, you know, embracing young people, reaching young people. Some people, though, some older people have gotten alarmed. We've had some people leave, but some people have gotten alarmed. They think, oh, no, they're kicking the old people to the curb. This is not at all what's going on, but that's how they react. No, they go, oh, no, they, I'm not valued here anymore. No, that's not true at all. You're valued more than ever. Oh, they're just going to fire anybody on staff who's over 30. I hope that's not the situation. <laughs> Everybody's going to be expected to wear skinny jeans and have tats. <laughs> nope. That's, that's, not what we're, that's not what we're trying to accomplish. I do like happy socks. That's something I think that we could, we could all benefit from. No. What it does mean is, is we care about other generations. And it's important to us. It's healthy churches think about other people than themselves. We've talked about that of being multiracial, but that's not today. Today, we're talking about being multi-generational. Multi-generational is so important. It's very, very important. And I want to talk to you and unpack it just a little bit. Why should we think three? Why should we think generationally? Well, number one, young people are underrepresented in the church. Now, this is church, capital C, in the church. And I'm specifically talking about the United States, but it's true worldwide. Young people are up, underrepresented. And this has been true for a while. I mean, I remember talks about that when I was a kid. I mean, when I was young, you know, church leaders wringing their hands, worried, how are we going to reach younger? And it's a valid concern. You read books on biographies of, of, of church leaders. They were concerned about that. Now, in our day and age, that is, a, that is a legitimate concern. That is a legitimate concern in our country. I want to show you some U.S. demographics, okay? And in this, I want to do a little generational shout-out, too, so we kind of, you know, get to experience who's here and who's represented in our church. The first of all is the greatest generation. 
This is, these people are born before 1924. There's 1 1.9 million of them in the United States, less than 1% of the population. These folks have lived through the Great Depression. They fought in the Second, um, the Second World War, and appropriately they were named the greatest generation by Tom Brokaw. These are people that are 93 years old or older. Do we have anybody here who's 93 or older? Nobody. Okay, well, <laughs> not too many of them, right? The next is the silent generation. They were born between 1925 and 1945. 30 million of them, or less than 8% of the U.S. population. Time magazine in 1951 named them the silent generation, but it doesn't mean that they were not influential. Some people refer to them as the builders, but they're huge shapers of culture. These are people that are between 73 and 92 years old. Are there any of you in here? 73 and 92. If you're, is there nobody's 70? You just don't want to own up to it. <laughs> there we go. We got some. There you are. Between, <laughs> We're glad you're here. We are glad you're here. You, then you have the baby boomers. Baby boomers are between 1946 and 1964. There's 75 million of them, which is 23% of the U.S. population. And they were named because of the uptick in the birth rate after, the, after World War II. Boomers are, are ages ranges between 54 and 72. Are there any of you in the room? Okay, there you go. Some more. All right. Woo, I'm part of that group. <laughs> then the next is Gen X. Gen X is born between 1965 and 1980. 66 million of them. They're 20% 20, 20 of the U.S. population. The name Gen X was popularized in a Douglas Cooper novel in 1991. Some people refer to them as busters. But the Xers are between 37 and 53 years old. Are there any of you in the room? Okay. Oh, quite a few. <laughs> All right. Then millennials, right? Millennials, born between 1981 and 1997. Did I miss something? <laughs> 83 million, or 26% of the U.S. population. Millennials were first called millennials in the book Generations, published in 1991. Millennials are, 20, are ages between 20 and 36 years old. 20, who's in here? A millennial. <laughs> All right. It's getting a little competitive in here. I like it. <laughs> so you have 23% of the, of the United States are millennials, and yet, you know, millennials are only represented 10% in the church. Underrepresented. But that's not the most underrepresented. It's Generation Z. Generation Z is between 1998 and, and born in uh, 2014. There's 74 million of them, 23% of the U.S. population. Zs are between ages 4 and 19. Now, uh, there's probably not too many. Raise your hand if you're between 4 and 19. Most of you are going to be upstairs or in the kids' ministry. But here's what James Emery White says. He's an uh, author uh, of... 20 books on this subject and teaches at a university at Gordon Conwell. Here's what he says. He says, as the first truly post-Christian generation, talking about the, the gen, Generation Z, post-Christian, and numerically the largest, Generation Z will be the most influential religious force in the West and the heart of the missional challenge facing the Christian church. They're more likely than, than millennials to not know Jesus Christ, not be part of the church, not have any connection there. They're, they're really an unreached people group in our midst. And we have to think about them. We want them to be part of what we're doing. We want to invite them to the table. I mean, we, this is kind of like the family, right? An extended family. We want the young people here. If you go to a family reunion and the young people aren't there, that's not good, right? You call them up, hey, what's it going to take to get you there? My, our family on our side of the family has had a family reunion every other year for many, many years. And over the years, you know, our kids got older, they got married, they started having kids. And now we, the, our last one, here's a picture of it. Our last one we met in Arizona and uh, I'm sporting the, the cowboy hat, you know. <laughs> and uh, we... Uh, 
we, we had four generations. My mom's there, her kids, their spouses, and then uh, uh, their kids. And so four generations. We want everybody there, right? That's what it's supposed to be like. And that's true in the church as well. It's important. It's not complete unless it's fully represented. Number two, healthy churches are multi-generational. That's a sign of health. You know, I know a lot of, it's easy to identify a big church, right? Oh, that's a small church, that's a medium church, that's a big church. But how do you know if a church is healthy? Well, this is one of the major signs of a healthy church, that it's multi-generational. That's, that, that there's young people, there's old people, there's, is, there's the blend in there. On the day of Pentecost when the church was born, Peter was preaching and he was given an explanation of how the gospel goes forth. Here's what he says. He's quoting from Joel 2, and this is in Acts chapter 2. Here's what he says. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on the, my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit into you those days. And they will prophesy. He's talking about a, a church that's healthy, that's filled with the spirit where there's pro prophecy and visions flowing, but he says that it's going to be multi-generation. He actually says there's going to be your sons and there's, there's younger people and older people. You have grandma and grandpa right alongside the grandkids and step-parents, and it, they're all there. They're all there. That's what makes a healthy church. Then number three, our church's survival depends on it. It depends on it. Every organization follows a natural bell curve where it you know, starts and then it goes, it grows and it plateaus and then it declines and then it eventually dies. Every, this is including churches, including churches. Churches go through that same plateau and end up dying unless they're thinking generationally, unless they're thinking three. They got to think three and every church has to make that choice. You have to decide, is it going to be about us? And I want the songs that I like and the music I like and the, the style of ministry I like. It's got to fit. It, it, I've got to feel good. The dress has to be like I like it. Everything's got to be just for my generation. And there's churches that make those decisions all the time. Did you know that this year in the United States, anywhere between four and 7,000 churches will close their doors? Those are churches that are not thinking three. They're thinking me. It's all about me, what I want. But if you want to be a, if we're, and I want us to be a church, but it has to be something we do together. We have to say, we want young people at the table. It's important. Our church's survival depends on it. Think of sports. Could you imagine coaches that don't think about recruiting? I think of, you know, this, uh, one of the top coaches, Nick Saban, University of Alabama, really is considered the best coach. There's only one other coach that has as many NCAA of football titles as him. And, and I was reading t this week about his, his methods of how he's so successful. He says it's simple. It's all about recruiting. He's thinking recruiting. Somebody interviewed him and said, when do you start thinking about recruiting for the next year? He goes, as I'm driving, after we win the playoff game, and I'm driving to the party to so celebrate it, in the car, I'm making phone calls recruiting for the next year. He's thinking three. He's thinking, he's got to think three. Could you imagine if he didn't do that? I mean, he'd have a great, a great team. If he's just thought, I'm just going to focus in on my team this year. I've given all my energies to that. You, a coach who did that would have a good team that year, right? Next year, not so good. Within a couple of years, they'd be dead. It'd be over. Their program would be over. Nick says that when he actually learned how to recruit by his dad when he was 10 years old, his dad, Nick Sr., was a, was a, a football coach for him, Pop Warner. And he says, son, go out and find some, find some good football players for me. So he'd go out, 10 years old, canvassing the elementary schools. <laughs> he'd tell the kids, He'd go up to the kids. He'd go, hey, guys, we got great football. We have cheerleaders, and we have ice cream. I mean, what do you, what do you say when you're 10, right? That's what, that's what gets him there. The team became a Pop Warner dynasty. One memorable stretch. They won 39 games in a row. That's where he learned it. That's where we need to realize it's, we have to get in that mind frame where we're thinking beyond ourselves. We're thinking generationally. We're thinking Three, 
Moses thought generationally. When, he, when he, God called him into to his project, which was to help lead the Israelites out of the, you know, the, uh, the, the slavery situation in Egypt at that time and all the things that, you know, bringing the Israelites into the promised land. Early on, he brought somebody alongside him, a young guy named Joshua. He said, hey, I'm going to show you some things. You're going to learn some stuff. Did Moses know everything when he started mentoring him? No. He was learning as he goes, but he was pouring into this guy, Joshua. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since he was a youth. And so later on in life, finally, when Moses, he's, he's older, God says, you're going you know, you're, you're to die. You're not going to be able to actually make it into the promised land. Moses, his first thought was not himself. It's his community thinking, hey, I've raised up this guy. He'd be a good guy to lead after me. I've poured into him. I've mentored him. God commissions him. It says, God, but God, but, but commission Joshua. He, this is God talking to, to Moses. And encourage and strengthen him, for he will lead the people across and cause them to inherit the land that you will see. Joshua takes over the leadership and seamlessly things go well. I mean, it just goes right into the promised land. Everything unfolds so well. Unfortunately, Joshua didn't mentor somebody. He didn't pour into somebody. And so when Joshua dies, the people of Israel, they go into this season of leadership, chaos, morally and spiritually, called the Judges. You can read about it in the book of the Judges, but it, that could have all been avoided if, if Joshua had thought generationally, had thought out a little farther. And we don't want that to happen to us, certainly. How do we do that? How do you mentor somebody? How do you think generationally? How do you think three practically? Well, let me give, me, let me give you four things you can do to think generationally, to mentor somebody. Number one, treat each person differently. Every person is different. And so you pray, God, give me discernment. You pray for wisdom. You go through our, 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 our growth track. In growth track, we help you to Figure that out. What is my person? How, do, how, how, how did God wire me? What am I supposed to do with my life? And if you're mentoring somebody, you make sure they go through so they get that. They understand that. And then you can, you can better mentor them. So grow track. That's how you uh, learn how to treat each person differently. Number two, share your failures and successes. We like to hide our failures and talk all about our strengths, right? Because when we talk about our strengths, we feel good. Yeah, I was pretty good, wasn't I? Now that you think about it, that was awesome. You know, I mean, we like that, right? But we don't want to talk about our weaknesses when we made stupid choices, when we were just dumb and, you know, we screwed up and, and some of that stuff we just, you know, it fills us like with embarrassment or even shame and we hide that stuff. But here's the truth. Here is the truth. Your greatest influence, your greatest impact on another person's life is going to be through your pain, not through your strength. So if you hide that, you remove your, 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 greatest, your greatest tool, your greatest ability to impact somebody's life. So you, you don't glorify it if you did something dumb, did something that God said don't do, and you did it anyways. You just kind of own up to that. But they can learn a lot from that. You will impact people way more through your mistakes and the hard-earned lessons that came from them. Number three, trust them with responsibility. This is so important. It's not enough just to talk to somebody who's you're mentoring and give them some good advice. No, we need to actually entrust them with things that matter. Now, if you look around our church, you'll see, you'll see young people all over, right? There's one today on the status update. You have them up on the stage. We have them in the youth ministry, in the kids ministry. We have them going on the missions trip with us. They're everywhere, all around. We, we entrust our young people with things that matter. We're not just like giving them chores. Well, Nobody wants to do this. Give it to a young person. No, that's not our attitude. <laughs> you know, we want them to do the fun stuff. We want, to see, we want them to see miracles and great things happening all around them because God will use them every bit as much as he will use somebody who's older. And they're doing an amazing job. Certainly they make mistakes. You might be thinking, hey, Andy, if I give a young person an important job, highly valuable, they, that sounds risky. Sure it is. But it, well, that's why you're mentoring them. It's not abdication. You're like there giving feedback, giving encouragement. And then that leads me to number four. Encourage them when they fail. Encourage them because they will make mistakes. So you build them up. You don't knock them down. The world is full of people who do not care 
if you succeed, that are waiting for you to fall flat on your face. You're, as a mentor, not one of those people. You're there to encourage them, to say, you can do it. Get up, go for it again. That's what a mentor is. Doesn't give up on them. Now, let me just speak to the other side. When you're the mentoree, now, most of, this, most of these people would be younger people, but it doesn't mean that because I think all of us should have a Paul in our life, somebody who can speak into our life. I certainly have people that are mentoring me and still speaking into my life. And so this applies to everybody, but specifically I want to talk to the younger people. Okay, these, sometimes I talk to young people and they go, gosh, I'd love to have a mentor in my life. This is actually the number one thing I hear from young people. I'd love to have a mentor in my life. And let me tell you, if you don't have a mentor, it's not from a lack of mentors out there. It's not from a lack of mentors out there. It has way more to do with you, your attitude, and your behaviors. You see, mentors generally do not get paid. Their pay is that they're making a difference in your life, which means a lot. And it's, I wouldn't miss it for a world. But part of being a mentoree is making sure that you're a blessing to the mentor. Because that's, the, that's all they get. Their pay is knowing they're making a difference. And so here's some things that you can do, two things specifically, to become a good mentoree. When you're a good mentoree, mentors appear. I guarantee it. Mentors appear. Number one, learn how to follow. Learn how to follow. You cannot be a know-it-all and have a mentor. Yeah, yeah, I know it all. I mean, if you don't have a mentor, that could be the problem. <laughs> because see, men, know-it-alls sometimes don't even know they, that's their attitude. You say, well, you know, you kind of sound like a know-it-all. No, there's some things I don't know. But I, I just know most things, you know. <laughs> and I certainly know more than my parents, you know. That's, that's a, that's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> but you can't be a know-it-all. You got to have this attitude of some humility. Paul talks about when he, his mentor was a guy named Gamaliel. And he says, he, there in Acts 22, he says, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You think he really sat at his feet? No, he's talking about a posture, an attitude where you come and you're willing to learn. You don't challenge everything. Every time Gamaliel says, I don't know about that, Gamaliel. No, I don't know. Yeah, you could be wrong on that. No. It means you're there to learn. And you can easily discredit somebody by saying, well, look at their life. You know, look at how Gamaliel talked to his, his wife last week. I'm not listening to him. You know, look at, I mean, you can't, you have to be willing to say, well, nobody's perfect, right? Because that's, if you want a mentor, I can tell you right up, they're not perfect. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect, right? So if you get Jesus, you're good to go. <laughs> but outside of that, you're going to have to say, well, I can learn from somebody who's not perfect, who has character flaws, who has cracks in their armor. That's what it means to be willing to learn and, be a, and, and not be a know-it-all and, to have a, and sit at somebody's feet. Look at what, how the Bible talks about membership. It says, have confidence in your leaders and what? Yeah, submit to their authority. There it is. The, this is the submit word, the word that nobody wants to use. You know, submit. Well, this is, it's, what is submission? It means Sitting at somebody's feet. Hey, you're a mentor. You're not perfect, but I can learn from you. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Number two, how do you know you're being a blessing? Then you be faithful in the small things. Be faithful in the small things. J Jesus laid out the expectations for mentorees. Here's what he said. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so we need to attend to the little things. When we're in a mentoree relationship with a mentor, they ask us to read a book. That's a priority for you. If you, don't, if you can't make that a priority, all of a sudden that, ven, that mentor disappears. Whoop, they're gone. Well, and then I don't have mentors. Well, what? Well, maybe you should have done what they had told you to do. You show up on time, even when it's inconvenient for you. You know, you, 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 you take care of broken relationships that are, you know, you, you, you make sure you don't have commitments that are unfulfilled. You, you are faithful in the little things. That's what it means to be a good mentoree. So I want us to think about, I want us to think generationally, think beyond ourselves, to think three. Okay, for those of you who are boomers, you know, you're, 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 you're 54 or older. 
So boomer, silent, raise your hand. If you're, if you're 54 or, no, it's hard to raise your hand when you're admitting how old you are. <laughs> but we're kind of a group, and I'm here with you. I'm part of that older group, right? We're older, we're grayer, we're, uh, you know, we, 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 we're a high mileage unit, right? We, we've got some miles on us. And listen, the temptation, I know, the temptation, if you're a boomer or older, is to think, you know, I'm done. My best days are behind me. My greatest influence is in the past. I'm just thinking kind of retirement now and, you know, and where can I go to retire and go play shuffleboard and, and uh, go relax, you know, maybe move to a warmer climate like, you know, like Arizona. You know, I'm from Arizona. You know, I was reading an interesting verse, actually, that talks about going to Arizona. Here, listen to this. Uh, I might be kidding, just in case you're wondering. Okay, it says, but it's in Acts 27, verse 12. It says, most people were in favor of trying to reach Phoenix. Phoenix is there. Phoenix, right? <laughs> if possible, in, in order to spend the winter there. That's, that's what old, old people do, right? Snowbirds, they, winter, let's go to Phoenix. Now, that's, I probably misquoted that, so just I wouldn't. <laughs> but don't do that. Don't count yourself out. You can have the greatest impact you've ever had from this point forward. Amen. You have way more education. You have more life lessons. Hopefully you have more wisdom. And you can pass that on. You can be one of those people that makes a difference in somebody's life. And it's not just that age group. All of us, if you're in the college age bracket, you can influence the high schoolers. High schoolers influence middle schoolers. Middle schoolers can help with our vineyard kids. There's all kinds of things you can do. Let me give you some practical things you can do to mentor. You can get involved in our kids' ministry. They're making a huge impact on those kids. Or our youth ministry. You can help with young marrieds or do premarital counseling with people. There's all kinds of ways. You could, one of the greatest things you can do to mentor somebody or a group of people is, is run and lead a small group. Now, I know that sounds like a big ask, but listen, we will train you. It's, it'll, if you decide to facilitate or co-lead or lead a small group, it'll be the greatest, the most f best adventure you've ever had. It'll be amazing. You will impact people's lives. You'll see it firsthand. Go, well, Andy, I don't know. I'm pretty busy. That's why we build it around your own life. We know you're busy. Who is not incredibly busy? That's why we say just look at your life and we'll build it around things you're already doing we're just saying, why not invite some people that you can mentor into the process? Whether it's like Jacob was talking about, cooking or reading clubs. We have all kinds of, you know, going to the gym. Or it could be a Bible study. All kinds of things. But you invite them into the process and you start mentoring them. You can make a huge impact. You say, well, how do I get trained? Well, next week, in step four, we're going to train you. If you're at all interested, you go, I don't even know. Well, just come and check it out. We'll show you how to, how to take that next step to be part of what we're doing, making a difference and influencing. It's, it'll be amazing. You don't, don't just think of me. Think three. No, on your outline, I want you to pull that out. Right here. Pull out, everybody pull out their program. If you're online, you have the ability to see this as well. Download it off our website, vineyardchurch.com. And on the very back of the outline, I gave you two questions to answer. Number one, who is investing in you and number two, whom are you investing in? Who are you mentoring? And I want you to list some names now, okay? I want you to, who's mentoring you? Everyone in here should have somebody who's mentoring you. I have people that are mentoring me. On my list, I put on, uh, I have Brian and John and Mike. Sharon is one of my mentors. I have people that mentor me. And, and now listen, to have a mentor means that they actually know your name, <laughs> okay? They, they, they have your contact information in their phone. If they don't have that, then they're more like a model. Yeah, why well, podcast? That's how they mentor me. No, that's a model. Nothing wrong with that. That's good. But that's not a mentor. A mentor actually knows who you are, knows your name, knows what's going on in your life. And then, and then, and the second line you put in there, who are you mentoring? Who are you mentoring? Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on that. Because God will use you to mentor somebody. Okay? What I'd like you to do now is I'd, I'm going to close in prayer. So would you bow your heads with me and close? And we're going to just take a moment before the Lord. If you've never put your faith in Christ, I would like you to just 
take a moment and just kind of dial down. Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for you. For when we do make mistakes, when we do feel ashamed, those things we, we do cover up, we're not proud of. And really those things actually hurt our relationship with God. It's part of the reason we're distant. So Jesus Christ died on the cross. He came, lived on this, this, this planet. The gospels were written to communicate how much God loves you. You just come and home and just say, God, today I want to follow you. Would you do that? Some of you, that's, there's a little voice going on right now. You can nudge it, and you're, there's almost like a little tug of war. And God is on one side. And then your self-will and your self-reliance uh, is on the other side. And what it means to put God in tr- control means you let go of the rope, say it's done. God wins. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a follower of Christ. And you just make that decision. And then you proclaim it. You actually say it to God in prayer. Say, God, today, today, right now, I'm putting you in charge. I'm going to follow you. You have wisdom that I need. It's not about joining the church. This is about getting right with God, coming home, saying yes to the Lord. Say yes. Count me in. Count me in, God. Now, when you, some of you prayed that, I'm going to ask you to respond in just a moment. Just by writing what you, you know, that you prayed with me and put it on a card and then we'll take the offering. You can put it in there. But now I want to pray for what we talked about today also with this being generational, being generational. So I want to pray for those of you who are you're millennials. Okay, if you're a millennial, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, just, we're, just keep it up for just a moment. Raise your hand if you're a millennial. Or a Gen Z. You're younger than that. Because you're, you can put your hands down now. But you are the generation that we want to reach. And the Gen Z. Your people group, millennials and Gen Z, your people group, as you know, most of them don't go to church. Most of them don't know Jesus. They're an unreached people group in our midst, in our country, in our community. So we're going to, we, and we, you know what? It'll be hard for us to reach them as, as the older we are, the farther separated we are. We want to empower you. We want to help you. We want you to step into, the, into, into leadership, and in places of authority where we can, we, can, we can help you and assist you and come along with you to reach your generation. I'm going to ask Sharon to pray over you right now. Okay, I want all my millennials to stand up. If you raised your hand, I want to just stand up. You are so very, very important. And those Z generation that are back in that area, I need you to stand up also. Okay. People that are sitting down, I want you to look at the folks that are around you that are standing. This is our legacy. This is our legacy. These are the people that are going to take the message of Jesus Christ to the next generation. And I want to pray over them what God has put in my heart, and I want you to agree. But I want you to stretch out your hand because they have a tough road to hoe. If you heard the statistics, you know that they are going to be the light to this to this generation, to our world, right? And so they desperately need us. So let's, let's just reach out our hand to them, and I'm going to bless them with what the Lord has put in my heart. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here and that you're present. And Father God, I thank you as one who has um, got some years on her, Lord. I thank you for these young people, Father. They are the future. They are the hope. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would go, that you would... Uh, clear up their mind, Father, where there's any confusion, I ask that you pull it back and you would show them who their true identity is, that they would know you, Father, that they would know that you saw them in their mother's womb and that you called them forth and you put a calling on their life and no matter what the world rails against them, it will not take it away. 
And I thank you, Father, for them. And I lift them up, Lord, to you. And as one who loves, Father, loves you, and I love them, I come around them with all these folks that are in this church today. And we ask that your angels would continue to protect them, that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to them who they are, Father, not just their identity, but the gifts and the talents that you placed inside of them. Father says even the hardship he's allowed to come your way because he is forming in you to be a greatness, to be a light, to be salt into this generation. And Father, I thank you for these young people. And I ask, Lord, now that all that they see, that they would be able to uh, perceive what your Holy Spirit is doing and that they would walk with confidence and with assurance, not in themselves, Father, but in you. And that whenever they're challenged, Lord, they might call upon the name of Jesus Christ and that they would hear your Holy Spirit speak to them be strong like you did uh, Paul and Silas and, and all the saints before, Lord, that the whole power would be poured into them, Lord. And I thank you, Father. And those that, Father, that are lifting their hands to lift up these young people, Father, convict us in our hearts, Lord God. Let us be moms and dads, Father, to these folks that are, are not natural born but are spiritual born that we might lift them up, that we might daily pray for them, that we might have eyes to see what you're doing and encourage them each and every day that we see them, Lord, and that we'd have strength, Father. I hear that. Father says to those of the generation that are sitting down that he has given you the pen, not a physical one, but a spiritual one, and that your legacy is for you to write. And every time you spend time with a young person like this, every time that you deposit into them, he says, you are writing out your legacy, and that legacy will outlast your life. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take these, these words, these common words, Lord, that are offered to you in faith, and that you would do what only you can do. And we just ask that you keep them in your heavenlies, and that you release them here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.